This conference will now be recorded. Okay, I believe my uh, screen should be sharing now. Yeah, um, it is. Beautiful. Um, thank you all for uh, attending this. Um, I'm going to give you a talk on the uh, parking riverside extension, um, focusing on the, uh, the slab track and the design to construction. Um, short bit about myself. Uh, my name is Chris Hardwick, um, and I'm presenting this obviously on behalf of uh, Romberg Sursa. Um, I'm a principal engineer with Romberg Sursa um, for a civil engineering project. I'm, I'm a mechanical engineering background. Um, I spent a lot of my uh, sort of background was uh, on doing a PhD in the effects of third body materials in the wheel rail interface. So friction modifiers, adhesion enhancers, and through that I spent uh, eight years with uh, LB Fosters. And uh, in 2018, I decided to make a bit of a change. I wanted to uh, build something for once, and uh, I made the leap and joined Romberg Sursa. Um, so to give you a bit of a background on Barking Riverside, Barking Riverside is one of the largest residential developments in the UK at the moment, and it's um, got planning permission for over 10,000 new homes. 65,000 square meters of commercial, retail and community facilities and uh, here we've got a drone footage, a drone uh, overview of the site uh, from a few months ago. Um, obviously with the development of this scale it can't be achieved sustainably without the appropriate transport links and this is hence where we come to for the Barking Riverside extension. So the Barking Riverside extension it adds four and a half kilometres to the London Overground Gospel to Oak to Barking line. And that takes it from Barking to the new terminus station at Barking Riverside. A part of this project is a one and a half kilometre viaduct, which is built with twin track ballastless track systems, a slab track, and that connects the Tilbury lines to the Barking Riverside station. Now, the talk today will cover the uh, what Romberg were involved with, so the design of the intermediate layer, the slab track, and Slabjack S and C. And we'll go through some of the challenges. So we, uh, the project itself, logistics, we had uh, 711 trap slabs in total. That's 679 for the, uh, the plane line, 32 for the S and C. Now this was made up of 90 different variants. We had to deal with gradients, inclines of up to 3%, tight radius curves, 220 meters on here, 100 millimeters of cant, we had to deal with the interaction of the uh, the bridges itself, and also once the bridge was construction in construction, uh, we had to deal with movements of the bridge on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, we had uh, 1,250 square meters, uh, sorry, meters cubed of self-compacting concrete, four 4.8 thousand liters of uh, grout, and dealing with the S and C 2242 2243 Alpha Bravo scissors, it was the first of its type in the UK to be built on precast slab, and uh, that was completed using Voost Alpine, Unistar POE, and Srihag DFFSW supports. So I've already mentioned um, the project, it's four and a half kilometer extension, one and a half kilometers of viaduct, and this aims to provide four car service at 15 minutes intervals. Now, this time last year, Dave Mansfield did an excellent presentation that covers the designs of the viaducts or the gauging requirements. And uh, when I share the uh, the link, uh, when I share this, these slides, I'll make sure that there's a link in there so we can look at that. So I'm going to focus more on the, uh, the slab track and the design aspect in the construction. But here we go. I'll just give you an overview of the track. So the train here is coming up on the ramp and raft, which is a 200 meter incline at 3%. We're now coming on to a steel structure bridges at that point we've just dived over the uh, just dived over so we've gone over uh, the hs2 tunnels uh, and we've gone through 220 meter radius curve we're coming on a decline now and we're going through an s of a 400 to the left and a 400 to the right and we start to straighten out on level ground apologies Straightening out on level ground, going through the S and C, terminating at the Barking Riverside station. Apologies for that uh, 
slight mess up. So the key facts for the track geometry, line speed of 40 mile an hour, tightest radius we have on the project was 220 meters with 100 millimeters of cant. We've got a gradient of 3%. The viaduct structure itself, there is a 200 meter ramp and raft, which takes you to the viaduct. The viaduct is uh, 1.5 kilometers long, consisting of 31 decks, nine of which are steel composite decks, they're typically 40 meter spans, and we have 22 concrete decks, but they are two twin span, 25 meters, so 50 meters in total. And deck 27, which is where the SNC is situated, is four spans, a total in about 100 meters. So, design and build. Rail for London provided a GRIP 5 design. Now, the GRIP 6 to 8 contractor were uh, informed they'd have some design to, to do, and the GRIP 6 to 8 contractor was Morgan Sindel, Volker Fitzpatrick, and they joined together to make the MSVF JV. Romberg was subcontracted to the design and build of the slab track. So our design phase started in January 2019, and we uh, submitted the Form B in May 2020. And that encompassed the 1.7 kilometres of slab track, 2242, 2243 Alpha Bravo points on slab track, and the design for the intermediate layer. Now, throughout this design phase, we had a number of challenges to uh, overcome, or such as, like I say, precast SNC, dealing with uh, the existing structures, track bid interaction, so how would we design the intermediate layer, and how would we deal with the movements of the, uh, the bridge itself. So, just to give you an overview of what we were tasked with again, we have the slab track, which is in green, we have the lower level, which is the stable uh, foundation, let's just call it, which we have the uh, intermediate layer, this is the layer that's built on top of the viaduct, and then in between we have a self-compacting concrete, which fixes the slab track to the viaduct. So, the, one second. the track form selected for this project was the poor STA or slab track Austria. Now, the slab track uh, Austria system it's discrete precast reinforced concrete slab. Now these are typically 5.2 meters in length, 2.5 wide or 2.4 wide, with an approximate weight of uh, five tons. And with this, we use the system 300, or 300 system fastening. So the slab track itself is set on a suitable formation or foundation, in this case, was the intermediate layer. And it's fixed in place with an in situ self compacting concrete, which is the green which we can see here. And by setting this in situ self-compacting concrete, that provides the shear connection between the uh, formation foundation layer and uh, the slab track itself. Um, I was trying to work out where to fit this in. Um, we're no longer in the dark ages. Um, the project was uh, designed with BIM in mind in digital construction. One of the first things uh, we had to do was adopt all the models from uh, of the bridge design and build the whole project and our slab tracks in 3D. Now this takes place of looking at how we distribute our slabs, how we deal with tolerances, how we can deal with the, uh, the space that's available and we use BIM for the, um, the models for class detection. And it allows us to simulate the build and help us to deal with our program and plan. So the slab track design itself, I'm not going to go into the, uh, the details of actually designing the slabs or the, uh, the structural calculations here but just to sort of give you an overview of what, how the job's done. So we have the track alignment, and we also have the uh, 3D uh, models built in an ideal case of uh, the, the viaduct structures. And one of the first things we do is uh, 
bring the, uh, the slab track into that model and we distribute that across the viaduct and we deal with the alignment of that so one aligning it with the uh, the track alignment but aligning it with construction joints aligning it with deck ends so gaps between uh, adjoining uh, bridges we also have to consider the drainage um, one of the things that design, uh, drives the panels actually is the as you'd expect is the track geometry so the curvature of the track is taken up within the uh, the panel and we also have the length of the panels obviously varies for aligning with the bridge decks aligning with the uh, the construction joints and when we looked at this we ended up with 711 panels and 90 different variants <laughs> so this comes through with uh, if you think that you have a constant radius you'd have one type of panel but obviously we never have just constant radius we have to uh, get to that radius so we have transition curves and this means that you have multiple geometries coming through um the cant itself now that's taken up by angling the slab and uh, the scc layer fixes that into position self-compacting concrete so the intermediate layer as I mentioned, this was the layer that goes on top of the bridge deck. Now, this had to be designed as such that it could deal with the flexural movement of the bridge itself, but also not impact on that. So, the intermediate layer itself for each deck was a nominal 200 millimetres thick, full width of the, uh, the viaduct. But it wasn't continuous. This was built in bays, which you can see in the, uh, the lower left hand uh, picture. And this was done as such that uh, you weren't affecting the natural, uh, the neutral axis or the stiffness of the bridge itself. The, uh, the layer was heavily reinforced and we had uh, stirrups brackets sticking up from the viaduct uh, to provide a sheer connection with our slabs. Movement of the bridge decks. So another challenge that we had to overcome within uh, design was actually how the physics of a bridge, how it moves. So due to the uh, bearing configuration and the uh, design of a bridge, lading of a bridge causes a rotation at the deck end. And as such, you have the bridge rotating, we have an uplift force that's imparted to the fa fastening system. So the fastening system itself has to accommodate that load. Now within the bridge design on barking, these uh, rotations exceeded the, uh, the value specified in the uh, European standards which is two millirads. Such this we had to redesign and um, I'll come up with a solution that meant that we uh, we could accommodate this increased uplift force. So this was achieved by uh, designing special slabs for the deck ends. These were heavier duty slabs, increased thickness, increased reinforcement, and on top of that, the first three support points of this use the uh, Schwiag bridge support point, which can accommodate a greater uplift force. So we increase the uh, capacity of the uplift from 12 kilonewtons to 27 kilonewtons. And elsewhere on that slab, we use the standard uh, 300 system. I mentioned at the start, one of our, uh, the, I think my favorite part of the design work, um, I suppose actually construction as well, was uh, the SNC, uh, the uh, NR56 CVs scissors crossover. So the client wanted to maintain continuity of precast track form throughout the project, which meant that we uh, we had to come up with a different solution. We uh, we considered multiple combinations of fastening system and slab for the project before we finally came up with this. Uh, solution which we adopted something we kind of call like a, a hybrid approach and meet in the middle key consideration for us was looking at the pre camber of the bridges the tolerance of uh, manufacture and that comes down to the rails itself the slab the uh, the fastening systems how would you have everything aligned as such that you you don't come into a situation where you, ah this doesn't fit so this final solution that we came up was to say this meet in the uh, middle approach so the precast concrete slabs 
we needed 32 in total to cover the uh, the whole SNC of the scissors crossover. Now these differ from the plain line slabs because in plain line slabs the uh, the fastening system is factory fitted. We came up here the pocketed solution to allow uh, to take up any tolerances, allow you to move to uh, basically get the SNC exactly where you needed. I needed that. And that came with the uh, through the use of uh, Shriag CFF SW fastening system. Now, working with uh, the client, um, we pre it was prescribed that we were going to use the uh, Unistar POE, and uh, actually that should be fitted within the next uh, month or so on site. So, design phase, I say it was, uh, took a little over a year. Um, our main, main point here is we did the uh, design, the intermediate layer, the slab track, the s &C. We came up with uh, 711 different tracks, slab types. We dealt with the 3% gradients, the 220 meter radius curves and the scissors crossover design being the first of its type in the UK. So normally you'd wash your hands uh, and pass that over, but uh, I decided to join the construction team and became the construction CRE. So now to see how we uh, how we dealt with this. I suppose this isn't the exact beginning, but in, in the beginning, there were no slabs. This is a picture of one of our viaduct decks. Here you can see the tier key reinforcement protruding for the decks and the uh, the running rails. So these were the final rails that would be, would be used. Now these were provided by the JV, lifted up there. There were 60 foot uh, rails, flash but welded together. And these were gauged by us to uh, basically, we, we have a gantry system, which I'll come in later, which allowed us to position the slabs and run along the viaduct. So, from June to October, we uh, we managed to produce this. Um, but don't worry, that's not the uh, the end of the uh, presentation. Some of the key construction topics that I'll cover: are logistics. How do you deal logistically with uh, 711 precast slabs? We also have limited access and space. How do we get the uh, the slabs to the viaduct? How did we deal with the, uh, the concrete. Obviously, we have reinforcement to consider. Placement of uh, the formwork, how do we actually uh, physically get the concrete within to the slabs? And with everything, I've put this bit at the end, is the, the setting out the survey, the track alignment, how did we achieve the tolerances? And I've got more details on the, uh, the S&C. So logistics, storing 711 uh, track panels. So as I mentioned, the Slab Track Austria for this project was uh, built in Austria and delivered by uh, road. We'd planned for a phased delivery as such that we'd only have, you know, the just in time, the enough slabs on site to uh, for what we needed to construct in that month. However, COVID and all that uh, and project delays uh, it meant that uh, we had uh, basically every slab on site before we started. So on arrival, every slab is inspected and uh, we had to give them a number. You can see an example here, this is one of our slabs, Barking Riverside, down panel 128. Um, you can imagine with these slabs, you've got to know where they're ordered. So we produced something called a slab distribution list. And every slab itself was given a specific ticket which provides its details of its location, the orientation, the cant, and what heights it needs to be set, set at, gaps to the next panel, etc. So I mentioned we ended up with every, all of our slabs on site. Uh, I managed to get hold of some aerial footage. Um, we started off with uh, 200 panels for the, uh, for the station area, which is top right, uh, top left. We then filled uh, Dagenham Dock, mark it up. We then started to go down the side of the viaduct. We took more space up and it, in the end, uh, we were uh, 
a stage of storing panels underneath the, uh, the viaduct. Luckily, we had enough space, uh, but it's a consideration uh, for future that we, uh, you know, you can align your program for a just-in-time delivery. Moving the slabs around, so I mentioned each slab itself is five tons, uh, so they're not a uh, easy just just lift or get a few people there. We manage the ground movements around the site using high abs and slabs themselves were lifted to the viaduct using a crane. We had uh, three fixed crane locations and a crawler crane. Um, due to spatial constraints in the station, which I've got a slide on coming up, um, we knew that we needed uh, a gantry. And actually, once we designed these gantries, these gantries were used to lift and transport the panels along the viaduct. And they actually managed to position the uh, panels for, uh, I'd say, on average, plus or minus 10 millimetres. There's a fair number of them that they got on uh, to uh, sub five millimetre positioning. Here we have a uh, top right picture is one of our gantries carrying a panel. Our gantry is being lifted up to the viaduct. So I mentioned the station logistics. Part of the uh, the station design required that we had to combine the uh, the intermediate layer and the SEC layer. So we had a lot of reinforcement. Now part of the station is also covered, so there was no way that we could lift the panels via a crane and drop them into the station. So we came up with the uh, the gantry design. Now, just to show you how tight it was. Um, to the uh, the platform wall, we've got less than uh, we've got 20 millimeters clearance there. But uh, yeah, it worked very very well. Very tight, but very very well. Um, reinforcement. We had 48 48 uh, tons, I believe, of uh, steel reinforcement. Uh, uh, steel reinforcement. This was a mixture of mesh, bars and cages. And one of the uh, reasons for this was dealing with the drainage. So if a, uh, if a bridge deck slopes to one side, you're typically going to have uh, the SCC being thicker, thicker at one side or one end of the deck and thinner at the other end of the deck. So we had a lot of reinforcement to be in there. My, uh, my graduate engineers were probably hating me because they had to go out and do my ITPs inspections on every uh, every bar was it in the right location with the right number of bars in, and subsequently once the uh, the slab track was on, did we have sufficient cover to the uh, to the concrete and to the sides? So we have um, reinforcement. We've used our gantries to place the rail. I'll come on to the alignment uh, later, but. Once you've got your track slabs aligned, you need formwork around the slabs. This is secured in position. And uh, through having the, uh, the the models, we were able to, uh, or the 3D models and using BIM, we were like, able to accurately calculate the, uh, the volumes of concrete needed for each pour. And uh, the sum of that, 1250 meters cubed, um, which was 93, uh, 193 loads. Um, every load was tested, which is a uh, testament with our QA. Um, I think one of my most frustrating days was our first poor day, um, where we uh, we rejected three loads whilst we were starting. So we uh, actually delayed my start concrete by a day. But testament, my guys were excellent in the testing, and we also did this alongside independent testing. Um, delivering the, uh, the concrete to the viaduct, we had four different methods, using a crane with a skip, pumping the, uh, the SCC, we had a mobile mixer, and using our uh, gantries, we also had a cassette system. So here we have uh, an RRV with the, uh, with the agitator. For some of the locations, um, we had to work under the, uh, the overhead uh, the mains overhead line, so we could only use a uh, an excavator carrying a small uh, two cube skip. And on some of our night works, we had a mobile uh, tracked mixer. And short video here is our gantry system. 
uh, carrying its own concrete distribution system. Um, no project can run without a, a set of uh, a team of surveyors or engineers. Um, setting out and survey was a key part of this project. We had uh, a team of nine site engineers and surveyors. We used uh, a total of five Guido track trolley systems. We also backed this up with uh, the uh, joint ventures or MSVSs. Uh, survey team it's a, uh, a double check with us so the client they provided the survey control which consisted typically of uh, wall mounted uh, spigots on the, end, on the pier ends 40 meter spacings um, when we took over the site we did a full initial uh, survey which allowed us to preset the uh, the heights of our slabs the spindles and be able to calculate the uh, the volumes of SEC that we needed. And in this set out, we, we marked the edges of panels, et cetera, where our spindles might go to, uh, to plus or minus two millimeters. And this allowed us to place the reinforcement and initially put the panels to a sub millimeter 10, uh, 10 millimeter accuracy. Once our panels were in position, survey team, uh, did a lot of work using a Guido uh, rail free bar to align the panels without the rail. And then we uh, finally fitted the rails and uh, did a pre final adjustment just before the concrete pour. Surveyors, surveyors, they always have challenges. Um, what did we have to deal with? Thermal expansion of rails. Um, we were doing this in midsummer. Um, it was always an issue with us. Uh, we could uh, we could have at times unclipped the rail from the uh, the housings, but then that means we're not accurately monitoring the positions of the slab. We had to deal with the movement of the decks, which I'll come on to shortly. Um, ensuring all the, uh, the survey equipment and the clients provides constant measurements. We we often found that we could have a mill or two different between track trolleys. Um, we'd be taking a measurement and saying, okay, we're uh, we're two mil to the left here, and we'd have another trolley saying, oh no, you're spot on. The JV would uh, push their trolley around and say, oh no, you're, you're three mil. And this comes back to, you know, there was an error, intrinsic error in measurements anyway. Um, and it's something to consider with the, the tolerances. If you have a uh, plus or minus one, millimeter uh, measurement error so the range of two millimeters can you really uh, set out to plus two millimeters um so we had challenges but uh, you know the uh, the end product uh, was all well within the tolerances we're very happy with that um classic with uh, construction sites um everything was based off line of sight so management of people on the uh, on the viaduct and other trades, yeah, they they often got in the way of the uh, survey equipment, and at times, uh, survey equipment itself was damaged whilst on the viaduct. Um, the guys wanted a picture. This is our uh, our survey team um, on the uh, on the S and C. Um, mentioned thermal movement of the uh, the decks. Um, we have a series of uh, nine steel steel decks, and during the midsummer, I actually found that they were moving quite a bit during the day. And the JV themselves installed a, a monitoring system, and we were seeing up to 16 millimeters of, I suppose, either hogging or sagging. Uh, I suppose if you don't know where the uh, where the start point is, it's just 16 millimeters of movement over a 24-hour period. So for this, this mean it was it's a nightmare. How, how do you ensure that you can maintain your your track alignment when your bridge is moving itself? So 
the main way that we uh, we mitigated this was uh, going through a few weeks of measurement data, monitoring it, and we found that there was a typical 10 to 12 hour period where we could uh, see that the relative movement was approximately two millimeters. And this meant that we would work through the day, setting out and try and predict where our, um, what the movement's gonna be at night. That got us uh, pretty close, and then we worked overnight with the, uh, the final alignment and the concrete pour. So this was achieved for the first, the first uh, road, the down road, where we achieved uh, 120 meters per night, uh, approximately four, 43 meters cubed of uh, concrete. When we came around to construction, constructing the other road, um, we were quite lucky, the weather had changed and we found ourselves in a more stable environment. And you know, why this was happening, um, I'm not too sure. My, my sort of theory is, uh, is solar gain. There's a, a lot of sun hitting the, uh, the top of the viaduct, uh, the steel structures, whether they're expanding, the bottom of them is in shade. Um, it, was a, it was an interesting time, but we managed to uh, overcome that and uh, you know, we're very happy with the, uh, the results uh, of the, the alignment in that position. S and C, so I mentioned at the start, 32 bespoke, uh, track slabs, a hybrid approach, so I don't even know how to get this, a, a top-down, middle-up approach, which was uh, developed to sort of mitigate the influences of pre-camber, settlement of the bridges under load, tolerances in construction, obviously, you know, you've got plus or minus mil, two mil on the uh, construction of the essence itself. Do we have uh, tolerances on the, uh, the base plates? All these things, um, line up and uh, for this being the first time it was done I wanted to make sure that we had as many opportunities to ensure that we got it the final location spot on so the process that was taken here was the uh, the reinforcement was laid out the uh, the track slabs here were craned in or 32 now they were actually landed to well within five millimeters um Here's the uh, the picture of the uh, them all lined and levelled. We then uh, went through a process of placing the uh, 486 DFF3 uh, DFF SW base plates. We next bored the uh, placed one of the timbers across uh, the slabs so that we can land the uh, the rail on. Here we go using the crane landing the rails on so we're building the full s and c up here the next uh, process is to deal with the alignment so we use what's called the rosas or romberg switch alignment system and this allows us to lift the uh, the rails the whole s and c unit off the timbers allows us to gauge it we've got lateral vertical movement in the system and really hone the position, make sure you get your toe squares, the crossings are where they need to be. And uh, once we'd achieved achieved that, and we're really happy, and we had sign off that everyone was happy with the alignment. We then uh, work with the formwork around the, uh, the precast slabs, and then we start to concrete for the SCC and lock the slabs in position. Let's say this gives us another opportunity once the slabs are in position and set, rechecking the alignment giving it another go and say, right, yeah, we're absolutely happy here and we can start with the uh, grouting or fixing of the base plates in position. And uh, from my experience, writing do not walk on a, uh, on a piece of formwork is almost like sitting a child in a room with a red button and saying, do not push. Um, it was quite frustrating telling people to stop walking on the formwork. Um, so, once we have our, our alignment all sorted, um, we used uh, 4,800 4, litres of uh, a grout to lock the base plates in. Um, one of the processes with uh, using a grout is to make sure that the, uh, the body that you're grouting in is, uh, has been fully saturated. 
Um, this involved with, uh, luckily for us, there was a lot of rain, so our pockets were filled with water. Um, however, using a pipe to uh, evacuate, take the water out was quite a, uh, a painful task, especially because once you've done it, it subsequently rained and we had to start again. Um, our final pro uh, product, you see in the lower picture here, it's a lovely uh, picture from the time lapse uh, camera that was fitted over there. Quite like the nice night view. Um, so we were very happy with that. I think key learning points uh, just on that itself. Um, BIM or uh, 3D design. Um, when you're designing something, you know you're, you're you're making it in the ideal state. So our viaduct designs didn't really demonstrate any of the pre camber. Uh, you weren't able to understand where the viaduct would be at a given temperature in the model. So we designed the slabs based on the uh, the REPW drawing, and that worked very well. Where we did come into an issue was that the, the actual track alignment geometry differed ever so slightly um, from the REPW design. And whereas that might only have been um, two or three millimetres, it meant that we were actually trying to pull the slab track and the divergent legs apart more than it should have been. So we did have a, a, a week or so where we were deliberating the best way of uh, achieving that and uh, we came up with a, a redesign of the track geometry to suit the REPW, which helped us in the end. And just to give you a uh, short time lapse of us building the, uh, the S&C. So here we have the, uh, the slabs being laid over the, uh, the reinforcement. Over two days, placing all the uh, base plates and then landing the rails. Had, we've had the, uh, the rails concreted, uh, the slabs uh, concreted in place, and now we're going through the routing process. And, uh, yeah, that's well. um, okay, so sort of give a, a summary on, on, on the thoughts of the project. Um, obviously, with every project, there's uh, the successes and there's the sort of learning points. So, logistics, I think we did. Uh, it was an interesting point of you know understanding how you would manage this, how you ensure that all the slabs end up in the right position and the right orientation. And I think we did very well with that. Uh, our handling of the, the concrete was very good and certainly our QA processes uh, were very good on that one. Um, the ability to get concrete into the tight locations, certainly within the, uh, the, uh, the station or under Chokes Road. Um, we did deliver the uh, the first application of precast SNC in the UK with uh, the Schwiag DFFSW, and uh, to be fitted soon, soon would be the Unistar POE. The slab track itself was uh, applied on the, in a uh, challenging environment on the viaduct. We had the uh, the 200 meter, 220 meter radius curves, 100 millimeter cant. Um, our alignment, um, well within tolerances. There are aspects that I think would need to be discussed in the future on how uh, tolerances are set. Um, development and use of uh, bespoke gant gantries was a huge success for us. Um, the main works were uh, completed on time and we had an excellent relationship with our client and JV. Um, logistics, um, no one could have accounted for COVID. We had originally planned this with a just-in-time uh, logistics approach, um, so panels being delivered. Um, I think we managed that well. Me measurement tolerances, yeah, I mentioned this a few times, the uh, surveying equipment itself has a measurement error. Um, 
and when you're trying to install slab track to uh, I think it's 2102 standard you don't really have room for error and if you have two millimeters plus, plus or minus one millimeter error in your measurement system itself that uh, that's quite difficult to achieve a, a, a two millimeter uh, installation um, accumulation of tolerances keeping on the same sort of subject um, there's always inherent tolerances within each system so the panels themselves the rail um, wells we had a number of locations where um, we had a one to two millimeter uh, drift on our vertical alignment as a result of the the wells um, one of the other ones with the the track alignment um, is rate of change so it's it's always better than rather than looking at the relative the absolute sorry location of the track is focusing on the rate of change however when you're in a steep rate of change of can and it's designed to its maximum level if you've got a rate of change of uh, six millimeters over three millimeters how can you uh, over three meters um, that actually means your installation tolerance is zero um, so it's quite difficult I mean in, in the end our, our track alignment our, I was guess say it's the uh, the best sub track alignment in the UK I would say that <laughs> uh, but we're very very happy and proud of that and uh, the S&C um, it looks good uh, it's aligned very well um, I think there are a lot of learning points to take from that and in the future how do you look at, at that would you do the same approach meeting in the middle or would you prefix the uh, the fastening system similar to the way that you do um with the uh, the plane line track so yeah um okay just leave you with a few photographs and say thanks for uh, listening i hope i didn't put too many of you asleep but, uh, cheers that was really good thanks thanks chris um got a few questions in the chat kevin did you want to take us through the questions Okay, we've got no Kevin then. So the first one is um, from Paul Gray. I didn't switch. Yeah, no, I didn't. I was muted. Oh, okay. Go on, Nick. Go oh, on, Ian. Yeah, I'll do the first one then. So the first question is for Paul Gray. Obviously, to correctly on a great presentation. Um, obviously, was clearly what you what was. Um, I just wanted to know how you did when about doing the stressing, particularly on the plane line and S and C. What uh, what method did you use? Um, and then obviously a follow on question is uh, how do you replace a panel or if you can, etc. So thank you. Um, I suppose to make it easy and get out of myself on this one, the uh, Romberg didn't actually take part in the stressing, um, so I can't answer the, on the exact process that they used. But it was a uh, you know, standard rail pullers on uh, on on rollers. And when I briefly witnessed it, but I wasn't involved in the process itself. Um, in terms of replacement of a panel. There is actually a full process for this. Um, I suppose the question is, why would you want to be starters? But such an event that uh, if you had a derailment or damage to a panel, the first approach is to repair the panel. There are moulds that exist to replace, repair the shoulders. But in the event of the need to fully replace a panel, the uh, the rails can be removed, and uh, it's sort of running the uh, the installation process in reverse underneath the panels there is a rubber debonding layer so you can actually take the rails off reinsert the spindles lift the whole slab off you'd need to break out the self-compacting layer but then replace that with a brand new slab of the same with the correct geometry great thanks chris um <clears throat> Next question from Kevin then is about um, the delivery of the of the um, slab. Um, did you consider using rail? Um, yes, we did actually. The um, the the slab itself, also the the manufacturing plants in Austria and Germany were uh, close to railheads, and we originally did have a plan to deliver all the slabs by rail to uh, the DB Schenker yard, um, which is uh, just across the road from Barking. Uh, from the from the construction, uh, it just happened at the time uh, that that didn't come into fruition. 
and we had to be uh, go down the route of the uh, using lorries. Okay, thanks. Um, uh, so we've got a question from Thomas, uh, which is about the volume of concrete used, and was there considerations ar around moving the industry to to net zero carbon? And you've got a bit of a follow up question around the rolling stock and whether there's going to be overhead lines and whether you're going to use the gantries as part of that in the in future um, developments. Um, oh God. Um, I think obviously the uh, sustainability is a key key for all future designs. Um, I personally wasn't involved in uh, sustainability calculations or with the uh, result of the, the, the volumes of concrete being used. Um, however, I suppose, you know, different designs, you could minimise the volume that was uh, needed based on where you position, how you deal with the cant itself. Um, the second part, of uh, the the question um it's another one which I, I would deflect there's more information on the the rolling stock within dave mansfield's uh, presentation um here is a uh, the barking riverside is over overhead uh lines they're being installed uh, at the moment um, uh, but they're they're not using our gantry system to install the uh, the OLE. Great, thanks, Chris. Um, got a question from Liam, which is around the um, thermal effects of the track. And were they built into the design of the um, viaduct, or did you have to put in a, additional protection, like adjustment switches or, or expansion joints? Um, the uh, design itself did take into account the thermal uh, thermal effects um, and the calculations, uh, obviously, of uh, the maximum permissible um, stress. Um, the, the Barking Riverside itself, the majority of the track here is on uh, low toe load fasteners, and in fact, with the uh, through the design of both the track slabs and the uh, the viaduct, there aren't any uh, rail expansion devices. Great. Okay, I don't see any more questions in the chat in the chat does it does anybody want to um come off mute and ask a a question in per, in person just leave it open for people to do that hi ian it's gareth evans i've got a follow-up question on sustainability anything else thanks gareth go ahead yeah, hi chris um just wanted back back to the net zero question that thomas raised the, the slabs themselves is there any work going on to look at lower carbon uh, concrete to uh, to decarbonise that element of this kind of design. Do you know? Um, I'm sure it would be a consideration. I mean, it has to be really. Um, whilst we're uh, obviously involved in the design of the slabs for this project, we're not actually the manufacturer. And um, so I would definitely assume that uh, a low carbon or you know variant would be. Uh, in pause, uh, in pause, grasping in their view and what they're looking to develop. Thanks, Chris. Thanks, Chris and Gareth. Oh, anybody got any other questions? Okay, brilliant. So, um, really great presentation, Chris. Thanks. Can I can I ask? Can I invite Gareth to come in and do the uh, vote of thank thanks, please? I am sure. Yes, yeah. Chris, I'd like to, to thank you for uh, presenting to us on a fascinating project today, um, which is only serves as a reminder to me of the the key role that railways have in you know, the eco further economic growth in our country and, and regeneration of parts of uh, London that you're kind of developing this railway to serve. Um, I mean, I know I've known you since your LB Foster days, so this must have been uh, quite a challenge uh, and what a complex project to uh, to be involved in this CRE um, with all of the challenges of geometry, of the uh, logistics uh, and the innovative solutions that you were uh, committed to delivering as part of this, such as the precast s and and the, uh, the novel POE, uh, which we've also uh, recently installed up in Uddingston on the Scotland route. So clearly, um, you know, cutting edge technology, which offers massive reliability benefits as well. 
Uh, it was fascinating to see use of BIM uh, in the planning phases to uh, to support the uh, design of the construction process too, um, and and how you sort of using that to mitigate any construction risks and also calculating your material requirements, such as the SCC. So uh, yeah, really really fascinating to see how that's a technology for the uh, for the here and now to help that side of what we're doing hopefully make us more efficient as an industry in the way we build our asset. Um, I really love the, the purpose-built mobile gantry cranes as a bit of plant innovation and I wonder whether there's more room for that in our industry. Um, I don't know how that came about but um, I'm sure you know as we as we're changing the way we have to access and inspect and maintain our assets around the country there's there's definitely more scope for that kind of innovation to solve some of our um, maintenance and renewal challenges in the future uh, and again you you talked a lot about the challenges about tolerances both in uh, const design construction and, and measurement uh, and um, yeah interesting to to hear your reflections on the compatibility between different standards perhaps for the equipment that we use to measure the position of the running edges of the rail uh, versus the uh, the nominal requirements in standards to uh, to work within Tight, very tight tolerances, particularly for slab track. So uh, certainly one for uh, those of us involved in the world of standards to, to take away and ponder over. Uh, and then last, finally, um, you know, the, all the challenges you faced in terms of the thermal movement of the structure itself that you were building on top of. Fascinating to see how, again, how you had to uh, analyze the problem uh, in flight uh, during the construction and then come up with solutions to, uh, to make sure you were hitting the plan. So Chris, uh, you touched on a, a whole range of subjects in that one presentation, focusing on a major project. So thanks for, for covering some a massive amount of ground and giving us a, yeah, a really, uh, really good view of the project and, and, and yeah, well done for, for the delivery of that work as well. So I'd like to yeah, thank you all on behalf of Milton Keynes PWI section and uh, I'll give you a round of applause. We'd all give a round of applause, I think, if we could. Thank you, That's okay. thank you thank you for the kind words and also i'd like to thank you for the relatively short notice uh in putting this presentation together for us you're welcome there was a few late nights this week so <laughs> <laughs> uh i haven't got anything to add at the moment i don't know whether ian has got anything more for us. No, that was just that was going to be my last question. Really, was there any uh, any more announcements, Kevin? So um, that's great. Uh, so, uh, just be on the lookout, the section members, for the next meeting, yeah. which okay. which will.